The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for, before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com. Доброго дня, колеги. Мене звати Вячеслав Покатило. Від імені бізнес-школи Мім Києв я вітаю вас на проекті Reinforce.ua. Цей проект англомовний, тому тим, хто приєднався вперше і не говорить англійською, я прошу рекомендую натиснути кнопочку Interpretation внизу вашого екрану. Hello everybody, I'm Вячеслав Покатило, and on behalf of Мім Київ Business School, welcome you on Reinforce.ua. This project was designed in order to inspire Ukrainian business community and bring world-renowned intellectuals uh, to share their views and opinions about subjects that are currently on the world uh, agenda. Uh, this project became possible uh, due to the uh, generous support of Bogdan Havrelishin Family Foundation, uh, 50 Thinkers Organization, and three major business uh, education associations, AACSB, AMBM, and EFMB. We are grateful for all donations you've made when registering into the project and uh, uh, the collected money will be directed to support temporarily displaced uh, Ukrainian women who would like to start their own businesses. Um, before I shall give the floor to our honorable guest today, uh, I'd like to remind you that the project will be recorded and the uh, video record uh, will be available afterwards uh, on, uh, on this site and also on other uh, platforms. Um, Bill, Bill will work online and after the presentation she'll have possibility for a few questions. Uh, those who would like to ask questions, uh, please use Q&A button rather than chat. And now I am honored to uh, uh, introduce and welcome Professor uh, Ilyan Mikhov uh, on our project. Professor Mikhov has, has been the Dean of INSEAD since October 2013. And before that, uh, since 1996, he has taught microeconomics and econometrics in the MBA, MBA, a PhD, and many executive <coughs> education programs, as well as the Global Leadership and Fellowships Fellows Program on the World Economic Forum. He has been nominated several times <coughs> as, a, as one of the best teachers in MBA and MBA programs and won the Outstanding Teacher Award in 2006, 2008, and 2009. Uh, his research is on the topic of the related on topics related to the monetary policies, and uh, he will be advising to uh, uh, Bank de France, uh, was in research foundation, and also advisory board of the Bulgarian National Bank. He served as a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council of Fiscal of, Fis, uh, of Fiscal Crisis, and uh, actually we are currently uh, on the days when World Economic Forum is going on. And just this time, uh, President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, is presenting the participants of the forum. And But we appreciate everybody who chose uh, our project uh, to, uh, to participate in right now. Uh, Professor Mikhov, uh, uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce you, and uh, uh, we are looking forward to um, uh, your insights. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me. I want to thank everybody in the school for having me here uh, tonight. Uh, I just want to start by expressing my deepest uh, sympathies to all of you who are suffering uh, because of this uh, completely abhorrent war. And um, I really hope that it will end soon and it will end with victory. Uh, I don't know whether it was also mentioned in some of the introductions and uh, things about me is that I actually did live in Kiev for four years. Uh, and I started school actually in Kiev before going back to Bulgaria. So originally I'm from Bulgaria. So uh, it is my honor to be part of this project. Uh, and uh, I hope that we continue working together uh, with INSEAD. Uh, as a dean of INSEAD, I want to promote this cooperation. And I want to make sure that we can do, uh, we do at INSEAD whatever we can, you know, to support Ukraine and to support the rebuilding of, uh, of the country uh, after the war ends. So uh, let me, um, let me start with my presentation. 
I hope that uh, everything will be clear and uh, I will be speaking slowly. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, I, um, I want to talk today about economic development and the middle income trap. I want to talk about economic development because I really think that it is good to understand how we can accelerate the process of growth and return to normality in Ukraine after the war. Um, I will start with some basic data and then we'll try to build a framework for understanding all these. And at the end, of course, we'll have some questions. So let me start first with some very simple data. This is GDP in the world. So that's how we measure output or production by looking at gross domestic product. You can see here that according to this measure, uh, the United States has the highest uh, GDP, total output, total production. And then the second biggest one is China uh, as, as a country. Um, this measure, so for every country, we calculate this in their local currency and we use exchange rates to convert to, uh, to US dollars. And that's how we have created the sum of all GDPs around the world. Now, this can be a measure of power, if you wish, economic power, even political power. But there is one problem with this, and that is that we're using local prices to measure GDP. And sometimes prices differ across countries, even if the products are the same. And you know, there are a lot of reasons for this that we can discuss at some other time. So for example, in China, a kilo of rice might be 20 cents. In the US, a kilo of rice is $1. If China and the US produced only rice, US GDP will be you know, five times bigger than Chinese GDP as long as they produce the same amount. And that's not a good measure. So we actually adjust uh, this calculation by using something that we call purchasing power parity or PPP, where basically for every country we use the same global set of prices. So now here we recalculate GDP by using global prices. So in the in China, now a kilo of rice is one dollar, in the US it's one dollar, in Ukraine it's one dollar, in Bulgaria it's one dollar for the calculation of this. So only quantities will make uh, a, a difference here. And you can see that China has become the biggest economy in the world, according to this measure. Now, of course, China here is very big because there are a lot of people in China. So to measure whether the country is rich or poor, we use what we call GDP per capita, or sometimes we call this income per capita or income per person. It is the same thing. And we calculate it by simply taking GDP and divided by population, okay? We think about this as a very crude measure of productivity. So on average, how much value does a person create in the economy on average? It's not a perfect measure, but let's stick with it. So here are some countries in terms of their income per capita. Rich countries usually will have something like 45, 40,000 um, uh, dollars income per capita or more. And some of them have much more than that. And poor countries are at like four, 5,000 and so on. You know, when you look at this, you realize that there is a big gap between let's say Sub-Saharan Africa and the US. And some people, are very discouraged by this saying you know the global inequality is so big but in fact it's a relatively optimistic picture because when you look at the world these countries that are still below middle income or around middle income these are opportunities for growth in 1945 japan actually started 
or was relative to the US at the same level where China is today, about a quarter of the US GDP. And yet in the following years, Japan managed to grow very rapidly and became a rich country. So if everybody was at the same level, growth opportunities will be very small. But because there's still some countries that can develop, we can expect a lot of growth coming in. So income per capita differs across countries. Countries can grow. But the big question is, will they actually really grow and become rich? So here is the final pie chart I want to show you because uh, I think that it has very stark implications for the future. And here is how I want to interpret this graph. The basic story that I'm going to tell you today, the basic theory that I'm going to, uh, to discuss today has a very simple presentation. On the horizontal axis, I'll put time. On the vertical axis, I'll put income per capita. So income per person. I will argue that somehow there is something out there that I will call the technological frontier that moves surprisingly at a constant speed. If a country is rich, let's say in 1950, or was rich in 1950, the fastest way for this country to grow is by following the, or pushing the frontier, let's say until 2021. A country that is poor is below, obviously, the frontier because income per capita is on the vertical axis. This country should be growing very fast with a very steep line until it reaches the frontier and then it slows down and grows at the same speed as the frontier. This is our basic economic theory for economic development. And the reason is very simple. The reason is that in poor countries, incomes are low. If incomes are low, then wages are low. With low wages, you will see a lot of companies relocating their production to these cheap labor cost countries, producing more there. With more production, we have more GDP. With more GDP, more income. Income per capita increases. And at some point, labor cost advantage disappears. And the only way that you can continue growing is by pushing the frontier or by innovating. Now, if this story is right, it's a big if, but if this story is right, and let's suppose by 2050, random date, everybody reaches the frontier, and we can put the frontier at some random number, 80,000. So everybody has the same productivity in the country on, on average, but across countries then this pie chart that you see which is the population pie chart will actually we can use to multiply each one of these segments by 80,000 okay because remember that gdp per capita is nothing more than gdp divided by population so if i use this and put population on the other side by multiplying population by GDP per capita, I will create now a chart of GDP. So this pie chart will then show you the distribution of output across countries. China will be the largest economy, India the second largest, but the more shocking fact or the more shocking prediction of this calculation is that the advanced economies will be about 14% of the world output, 14, 1, 4% of the world output. So the economic power in the world will have shifted dramatically away from where we knew it used to be, if this happens. So the question is, is it happening? Or will it happen? Will China become as rich as the United States or India or other economies and so on? So I don't know, there are a lot of unknowns out there, but what I know is that I can trace whether this is already happening. So here I have the advanced economies at the bottom charts as a percentage of the world output. And you can see that in the 1980s, 
they represented the United States, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan were producing two thirds of the world output. As you can see, especially after the second wave of the world globalization since 1990, this share has gone down and today they produce only 42% of the world output. So will it go all the way down to 15 or 14%? I don't know, but the trend is very clear. So today at the end of the lecture, we should be able at least to have a more informed guess whether this might happen or not. So, you know, I'll skip this slide because uh, it's a very interesting one, but, you know, we are running out of time. And I think that there are a lot of things that we want to discuss in the Q&A. So first, let me start now building a framework for understanding economic development and how we can make countries like Ukraine in peaceful time grow faster. To understand this, I first show you US income per capita from 1870, which is the first year we have annual data until 2021. I use what we call logarithmic or proportional scale. This scale basically is very important in order to understand visually what is happening to the growth rate. If you have some quantity that is growing, exponentially, then you'll see charts like this. And nobody in the world with a naked eye can tell you whether growth is accelerating, constant, or decelerating. Where the economy is growing with 3% or 2%, it will be an exponential line that is very difficult to see. So what this scale is giving you is that if you see a straight line, the growth is constant, and the slope is the growth rate. So that's why I'm presenting in this way. You can see here US income per capita. You can see the big dip during the Great Depression, which the US lost 30% of its GDP. And you can see the Second World War, which for the United States was a big expansion. You can see that there are ups and downs. But what is really shocking about this chart is that no matter what happens in this economy, all of these fluctuations of income per capita are going around a roughly straight line. And think about this. In 1933, when the war ended, sorry, when the depression ended, the US could have continued with the same speed, the same slope as before, but at a lower level but it didn't, it climbed back. After the end of the Second World War, 1945, the US could have continued at a higher level with the same speed, same slope, but it didn't, it went back. So whatever happens in this economy, going up or down, it always ends up returning back to the same straight line. So let me now skip these two slides, and now let's just look at this thing. The more you think about this, the more shocking actually this is. I even sometimes do exercises in making projections and so on. It is very shocking because almost every 10 years, something new is happening in the economy. There was the early industrialization based on the steam engine. Then there was engine, engines with internal combustion, cars, electricity, railroads were built before that. Wars, two world wars, depressions, electronics, semiconductors, people flying to space, all price shocks. In the 1990s, the world was talking about the new economy that now with information technology will never have a recession again. So we can actually see that continuously something is happening. Population growth is changing, presidents are changing. And yet the economy continues to grow at the same speed of 1.85%. It has not returned back to the trend since the Great Recession, but you know, with enough time, I'm pretty confident that you know it will go back. So the more you think about this, the more shocking it is, because we don't expect constant growth over 100 and uh, 
50 years or so. And here is how these technological revolutions that every 10 years or so are powering the economy are described by the press. <clears throat> so here we read from Business Week, uh, it seems almost too good to be true with the information technology sector leading the way the US has enjoyed 4% growth. This spectacular boom was not built on smoke and mirrors. It's, it's a real thing. And it reflects willingness to undertake massive risk investments in innovative information technology and so on and so forth. We have fast growth and low inflation. From Forbes, we read that we're in a period of the most wonderful progress in science and invention, especially as applied to communication and transportation that this or any other country has ever known. It is obviously our present great fortune to live in what, in the light of history, will be recognized as a golden age of the American industry. So these are editorials in these uh, magazines. So they're a bit, you know, bragging about the state of the US economy. But the big difference between the two is that the Business Week article appeared in January 2000. Well, the Forbes article was published in the summer of 1929. They read exactly the same. We have a golden age. Oh, we have a spectacular boom. It's a real thing. Here, communication, transportation was telephone, telegraph, then cars, as well as more railroads. So every 10 years, we're, we're shocked by these developments, by the new industrial revolution. But the only thing that these revolutions are doing, they're pushing the economy at the same rate as before. So today we talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, digitalization, and yet the economy growth is the same as before, despite all these uh, amazing changes that are happening in the economy. So. What is important to understand is that I will be using this line as the representation of the technological frontier. It does not mean that the United States is the only country at the frontier, but it has been there for quite some time, so it is easier to use data rather than something abstract. So now let me skip this slide about natural resources. If there are questions, I'll come back to this. So in the US, we see how the economy has been operating in the last 150 years. What about the rest of the world? So let's first start with the G7 countries. Remember, my main story was very simple. The economies are growing over time with the innovation at the frontier if they're rich. If they're poor, they should be growing fast with a steep line until they reach the frontier. So does it work? Until 1945, as you can see from this graph, in the G7 countries, not much is happening. Some countries go up, then they go down. Some countries go straight, then go up. Japan and the United States had parallel lines until the Second World War. So instead of converging, getting closer to the US, Japan was stay keeping the same distance. And then something happened in Japan. In 1945, it started growing very rapidly. In 10 years, Japan recovered from the war. Then in seven more years, it caught up with the previous trend and it continued to grow. Japan was growing at rates of seven, 10, 14% a year, like China in recent history. Some people, look at this and said, look how fast Japan is growing. It will reach the US and it will overtake it and it will become by far the richest country in the world. But that's not how it works. Because here in the first 40 years or 30 years, Japan is growing through replication or imitation. They look at the US, they say, oh, you build cars. We can also build cars. Take an American car, disassemble it, reassemble it, call it Toyota, 
Maybe it's a better car, but that's not innovation. And through replication, you can grow very rapidly this kind of rates. Because the only thing that you need, the key thing that you need is basically investment. Build factories, organize people to work in these factories, and growth can be very fast. The moment you get close to the frontier, this is not possible. You copied everything that could have been copied. So now you have to start innovating and you can see all these lines are roughly parallel, which means that all of them are moving at this rate. But the important thing here is that in the G7 countries, we have seen already convergence. What about the rest of the world? Well, we have a lot of countries out there, so it is difficult to put them um, in one chart. So I've decided to create groups of countries. So the first group of countries are countries like Japan, Korea, Ireland, that have more or less converged. They have reached the level um, of uh, at the frontier or close to it. Then there are countries like India and China, which I'll put in the second group, and I'll call them converging. So they're still far. The United States is at 69,000, China is at 19,000. So the gap is still big, but they do follow my simple model of going, growing very rapidly until they get to the frontier. And then there are countries like Chile and Brazil, which is the third bucket, that have very, very low performance. So Brazil, for example, was growing very rapidly until the 1980s, reached a certain level, and from 1980 to 2015, their growth rate was zero. Brazil was one of the BRIC countries, but for 25 years, actually for 35 years, it had a growth rate of income per capita of zero. So it was not really a market that would grow and emerge quickly. And then there are countries like Argentina, which I will put in the fourth bucket, and I'll call them probably a bit you know, cruelly, but I'll call them growth disasters. Because Argentina was a very rich country in the beginning of the 20th century. It was very close to the US. So I would say that if you look at Argentina, it was growing very rapidly until the 60s, 70s, and then since then it has been stagnated. For one of the top 10 countries in the world, Argentina today is a middle income country. So it lost the opportunity to converge, it diverged away. So to have a good framework for understanding growth and how we, you know, what we can do for Ukraine, we can easily explain one and two, but we have to be able also to explain three and four. So how do we do this? I mean, if you look at the world, of course, there are even more extreme examples. There are countries that for more than 50 years, 60 years have been growing at very high rates and they've created miracles. They have transformed, increased, doubled, tripled, quadrupled their income per capita. And then there are countries that are disasters where today in these countries, income per capita is much lower than what it used to be. So we have to explain the left side, but also the right side. So let's step back and ask ourselves, what is really driving growth? So when I look at you know, our basic simple theories, growth is driven by, is generated in two ways. In the process of production, we can combine physical capital, which is machines, buildings, equipment, with workers, labor, and we generate, in the process of production, we generate output. So one way to grow is basically increase capital and labor, and you have more output. So you increase the inputs. This is called extensive growth. So we're just expanding the size of the economy without innovating, without doing anything, we're just building more factories and mobilizing people to work. 
The second way to grow is actually to look at this process of production and do it in a more efficient way and therefore increase productivity. Here is how actually the advanced economies are growing by increasing productivity. This is what we call intensive growth. We're using the same capital and the same labor as other countries, but we're using it more efficiently. So the important thing, however, is to think how we can generate other extensive or intensive growth. And the answer is that in both cases, you just need more investment. Growth is a sacrifice. You generate your income, but you don't eat it. You actually have to put aside money to invest in building factories, physical capital, educating your people, human capital, or if you're at the frontier in investing in knowledge, investing in R&D and so on. So countries that invest more actually grow faster. The next slide shows some basic data. So this is an average over about 40 years of how much of your GDP of your income is put back into the economy. In China, 40% of what they generate is investment, is put back into the economy to grow, to build a bigger economy. It's not surprising that China is growing at 9% or so. In other countries like Venezuela, less than around 20% is put it back in the economy. Venezuela is growing much less. So you can see the positive relationship. And that's not surprising. As you build a bigger economy, you generate more output. But really, what is important in ensuring that a poor country becomes rich? So, and this is actually because I see that there are some questions about Ukraine, but this is the main point, one of the main points of the lecture here. Because we have to ask the question, once we start rebuilding, what is really we need to do? Is it investment? Is it education? Is it something else? And all these three things will be important, but the question is how important they are. In 19, it was about 1996, two professors from Stanford decided to ask the question, why are poor countries poor? Is it because they don't have machines, physical capital? Is it because they don't have educated labor force, human capital? Or is it something else that is related to productivity? So they generated data from 93 countries. And here is the conclusion of their paper, which I'm going to illustrate by comparing Niger versus the United States using their data from 1988. In 1988, Niger had $862 income per capita per year, so about $2 a day. US was at $31,000. So what is behind this gap? In other words, let's imagine a counterfactual experiment. We take American machines with American worker, sorry, American machines, American equipment, and we ship them to Niger how much more output will they produce? And the answer was actually surprising to me at least, that yes, they will increase their income from $862 to 1,292. So times 1.5 approximately. <clears throat> so capital machines are important, but they're not going to create a miracle if you just put machines in there. What if you take American machines with the American workers that are trained on these machines and you ship them all to Niger? What will be the GDP per capita at the time? Well, the answer is a bit better because human capital is more important than physical capital, but it is still a bit unsatisfactory. So it will increase roughly five times or 4.5 times, but there is still a big gap they're working with American machines, American people in Niger, and they're still missing $27,000 in income per capita. 
because this one is 31,000 and this one will be 4,000. So what these people, these two professors from Stanford found out is that the biggest gap between rich countries and poor countries is not the lack of capital, not the lack of human capital, but it is the lack of the economic and business environment, what we call usually institutions. So they did this study and they found out that this explains the missing, you know, whatever color this is, lilac, you know, purple area across countries is explained by the quality of the institutions. So this is actually a very important result. And now let's summarize and we're going towards the end of the lecture. So what is driving growth? At the end of the day, basically growth is a result of either improving productivity or increasing investment in human capital and physical capital. Then there is a very simple question that comes to mind. What drives investment? Why in some countries like Korea or Singapore, you have 35% of the income is invested back in the economy. And in Bolivia, it is 16%. So why do people invest in Korea and Singapore and not in Bolivia? And the answer is came in the early 1990s that what matters is institutions. So the, the environment like property rights, corruption, good governments, stability and so on, generate uh, actually the environment for investment to happen. So in 2005, very brief story. In 2005, I was teaching our executive MBA class in Singapore. So this is by the way, a four hour lecture that I'm condensing in 45 minutes for you. So after four hours of exercises, of discussions, one of the students asked, you know, it's interesting to know about growth, but I'm still confused. After four hours, I still don't understand what is driving growth, which is very discouraging for the professor. And he said, in my marketing class, our professor gave us a very good framework to understand marketing. And this is called four Ps, price, promotion, product, and placement. And he said, can you give me something like this to understand growth, some framework like that? I said, look, you know, it's not possible because I'm telling you a story with some data, but I'm just using the data to illustrate a theory that we have developed with a lot of equations, with differential equations. I just don't want to write equations here, but the essence of the equations is basically this. I said, economics is a real science, it's not marketing. Well, I was not happy with this answer. He was not happy with this answer. So I went to my office and the next day I came back with the four eyes of economic growth. So the four eyes of economic growth, I knew that they had to be four, but the four eyes of economic growth, the first one is innovation. So at the frontier, we know that countries grow by innovating. That's how your advanced economies are growing today. The second eye is the initial conditions. Where do you start today? If you're a poor country, you can grow very fast. If you're a rich country, your growth is limited by the frontier. The third eye is investment. In order to realize this potential, the investment rate has to be about 25% for this to happen. Now, these three eyes, those of you who have studied macroeconomics, they will recognize that it is a story about the basic model of growth due to Robert Solo, called the Solo model of growth that is in every textbook of economics. The Solo model of growth is written in a slightly different way. It was in, written in 1956, and Robert Solo received the Nobel Prize for this. Policymakers started thinking, okay, we understand how to drive, to make a poor country rich, how to drive growth. We just need to invest. The World Bank chief economist in 1965 said that the fastest growing region in the world from 1965 for the next 30 years will be Africa. 
Africa was a growth disaster, as we know for this during this period. But they were saying this because the World Bank was supporting all kinds of projects, governments from Europe were supporting projects in Africa without necessarily thinking, are they economically viable? Are they profitable? Are they sustainable? So investment is important, but it has to be done predominantly by the private sector, not exclusively, but predominantly. Governments have a much more important and more difficult role that is to create the environment for this investment to happen. And that's where I think that we need to focus our, uh, our efforts to ensure that we get the right environment. The next slide only shows how these four eyes are applied to Singapore versus Venezuela. Singapore and Venezuela were at the same level in 1979. Probably at that time, if somebody asked which country will grow faster, Singapore or Venezuela? Many people would have said Venezuela because as you remember, all prices skyrocketed at the time. Venezuela has the sixth largest reserves of oil in the world. It's located next to the biggest market in the world at the time, the United States. Singapore was nowhere. And yet today, Singapore is the richest country uh, in Asia, and one of the richest in the world, richer than the United States. Well, Venezuela is at the same level as 50 years ago, stuck at the same level. The reason is that the third eye in Venezuela was very different from the one in Singapore. Why did people invest in Singapore, not in Venezuela? because the institutions in Singapore are very good at promoting business and business creation. So this is the last slide that I think it is uh, important and then we can start our discussion. When I started talking about growth and creating all these uh, uh, different slides, at some point in 2006, one of our students, uh, very challenging always, said, but wait a second, if institutions are so important, why is China growing? Does not have the institutions that you're mentioning on your slides? That was an interesting and puzzling question. So I started thinking, you know, what is really happening? And then I created this slide literally in 2006, obviously it has been updated over time. And I realized that there's something very interesting going on. So if you look at this slide, there are basically four quadrants, okay? On the vertical axis, I have the quality of institutions as measured by the World Bank. So they include the following things, political stability, voice and accountability, which is based on democracy, uh, rule of law, quality of regulation, um, government effectiveness, um, and one more that is now it's skipping my mind, political stability. Uh, yeah, and of course, control of corruption. So these are the six indicators constructed by the World Bank. Each, every year, on each one of these indicators, they assign a country a number between minus 2.5 to plus 2.5. So I averaged these six indicators, low quality institutions, high quality institutions. Horizontal axis, poor countries, rich countries. So the first thing that you can notice is that there is nobody in the upper left quadrant. There is not a single poor country that has good quality institutions. It is actually a very unstable place to be. If you improve your institutions, you move here, two things happen. Either you collapse back, so there is a coup or something, or you move very rapidly to the right, and then you escape this area. So very few countries are there. The other thing to notice, so this is number one. The other thing to notice that in this second quadrant, or this lower left quadrant, not the second quadrant, but the correlation between institutions and quality, quality of institutions and income is not very strong, unlike up here, where you can see positive, strong relationship. So what was happening with China, which by the way is now here, this is China. China was sitting here in 2006, 7, 
and it managed to grow because here institutions do not matter so much. You can move your dot to the right without reforming institutions. But here is another thing. There is not a single rich country that is on the other side of this wall. So this I call the wall because of China. So there is not a single rich country that has poor quality institutions. I mean, there's some oil exporting countries that we can discuss later, but there is nobody else that is built an economy uh, that has crossed this line. So today, uh, or in 2011, some people call this area the middle income trap. Once you reach this area, which I call the wall, you have two options, reform, and then you can become a rich country or get stuck and you'll be circling around here like Venezuela for 50 years or Argentina or Brazil and so on. So here is a big conundrum for the world where you are getting close to the wall and people will say, but you know, China is different. We don't know what they're doing, but they know what they're doing. So they'll go through this wall, the stupid wall, and they'll become a rich country without reforming the institutions. It is possible, I don't know what will happen, but I just know another thing, that in 1989, the Soviet bloc collapsed exactly here. Before that, it seemed like, you know, I lived 24 years under communism. So we were thinking this is not going to change forever. But the Soviet Union in the late 1970s reached the wall, reached this area, started, as you know, changing uh, secretaries of the Politburo, changing this and then until it basically collapsed. So it is very unlikely for me that China with these institutions will become a rich country. Those of you who, of course, are ask, asking me, but what, what about Ukraine? Where is Ukraine sitting? So you can see Ukraine here getting towards the wall. So it's still below this middle income track. But the quality of institutions and of course political stability sometimes is it's an external factor, like in your case. And um, I think that in order to sustain this growth, in order to generate this growth, some of these indicators that you see here have to be <laughs> so I finish it with this. Summary, four eyes, what to remember, everything, appropriate conditions, rebuilding an economy requires obviously financial capital, human capital, but also creating the right environment. Sorry, I took a little bit longer than I was planning to, but now we are done. Well, you have nothing to apologize, actually, uh, 40 minutes uh, uh, for four hours, it's, uh, it's a quite a challenging approach. All my questions, which I had before, actually disappeared with uh, with your first chart about the U.S. growth over the last uh, uh, 150 years. I can't remember how long. Wow. And you answered partly the the, the question about provocative questions like uh, how to explain China or what. Another provocative question in our case would be Russia, for example. Investment uh, in Russia uh, were, were much higher. Also, foreign investment in Russia were higher uh, because of stability. And uh, si looked institutions looked uh, look, looked stable. So, what 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 stability means is all this theory. But but let, let's keep it. Uh, I'd ask you the the question about democracy. Uh, there is one question from the audience as well. You know, democratic process itself uh, creates uh, instability, certain instability, and somehow um, uh, probably prevent uh, from one side uh, um, foreign companies to 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 enter with, in with investment, and from other side uh, uh, people uh, would like to let's say to 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 feel better and therefore. Uh, internal austerity and investment uh, in uh, in in capital uh, pre is not is not enough. For Ukraine, for example, it was always 
much lower than 25% you, you draw. Um, um, so, and Singapore, as a, as, as a good example, uh, at least at the beginning of its uh, uh, very fast growth, uh, as well as South Korea, very, very far from, let's say, democratic standards. Um, also China, <laughs> also China. So what to do with democracy if company, if country wants to become, uh, let's say, rich? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, they, there are six indicators here. Which one is really important? Because you know they might not be the same. And uh, it turns out that probably the most important one is the rule of law. Uh, in order to cross the uh, this, uh, in order to cross the, um, the, the the wall, Singapore indeed, and you're absolutely right to point out to Singapore as one of the. Sorry, this one, I don't know why my pen is not working, but uh, Singapore is um, on democracy on the voice and accountability is at the 38th percentile, only 38% of the countries in the world have lower scores on democracy than Singapore. But on everything else, Singapore is at the 99th percentile. Everybody's below uh, Singapore. So I would say that it is true that democracy is important for many other reasons, but to generate growth in the beginning, I think that it's not a key factor. It is possible to generate growth in the beginning, especially in the second quadrant, which I call the second, the lower left quadrant. You can generate what the Soviet Union had done with the plant economy was growing at seven, eight, nine percent until you reach the wall. So China was growing with this. Now, democracy is important for other reasons, but also. What I can see, I've been living in Singapore for the last 20 years. So what I, I can tell you that, uh, you know, in the last 12 years or so, Singapore, which is up there, has been the most, has been reforming a lot. Because once you reach the innovation level, you have to have creativity, you have to have openness, people have to have different mindset. And Singapore realized this, so over the past 10, 15 years, they have been changing a lot of the laws out there in order to create, to become uh, more democratic. So that's, uh, I mean, you're right that democracy has positives and negatives. I still think that it is good, it's better to have democracy than not, but uh, it is not essential for this story. Um, okay, about, about education also. Um, yeah, education, uh, education uh, itself doesn't consider to be a, a capital, uh, um, let's say, um, complicated, a capital intensive, uh, but 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 it is. Uh, for example, let's say in Ukraine, we have the uh, growing and very famous IT segment uh, in, in economy, um, and people uh, sell their their knowledge uh, outside, mostly on 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 other on other markets outside Ukraine. Uh, uh, and uh, but at the same time, investment in education in Ukraine is low, which means that it cannot last long. Um, yeah. How to find money to invest in education for poor country? Yeah, education is very important. There is, I mean, I'm a professor, so I'm not going to say anything else. But I think that what sometimes we miss is that reforms in education without reforming the environment will only lead to very highly qualified people leaving the country. And we have seen this. In fact, if you run a regression, a proper regression, very often you will see that countries that have reformed their education in the last 30 years have seen lower growth, but they have seen very high brain drain. So, Education is important, but it has to go again, hand in hand with making sure that you have the environment for these people to stay, because otherwise you're, you're just investing. It is part of the equation. It is part you know, of human capital, it is part of the labor, and that's certainly an important, uh, in, an important investment. 
Well, I, I would re reiterate the question which from our audience, uh, you, you partly answered on it, but uh, uh, let's some kind of a stress and underline it. What is the better starting approach for Ukraine in terms of growth? Uh, is it extensive or intensive? Uh, that, that's exactly, uh, uh, says Kirill Znovai country that exactly asked. So I think that uh, I think that here, when I look at Ukraine and where Ukraine is today, you know, investing in innovation is a very long shot and it requires a huge ecosystem. Today, where Ukraine is, it is much better to focus on the extensive growth. And I think, especially after a war, you don't have any other option, but you have to build the capacity. You have to invest in factories and you have to invest in, um, in rebuilding the economy. So to me, uh, it is extensive growth. It is possible for a country to leapfrog, to jump further without going through all the steps of economic development. But that has to be done very carefully. So in Singapore, I'm actually on the board of the um, Economic Development Board of Singapore. This is the agency that basically created the miracle. So these are people who think about what is happening in the next 20, 30, 50 years, and how do we position Singapore? What industries do we attract in order to make it successful and competitive? In these discussions, even Singapore, that is at the frontier, they focus on manufacturing, they focus still on expanding the economy in this area, and not just saying, okay, let's just create the knowledge economy and digital and so on. They do this, but they would still focus on uh, developing a, a real base. So my recommendation for Ukraine, and again, I, I have to study a lot more about Ukraine to give you a more detailed answer, will be to have an economic board like this to say, these are the industries that will match best with our skills. So we have people that can work in these industries. We want to attract them and develop them. And these are the industries where we want to go, but we don't have the skills yet and develop the skills so that you can develop these industries. But it's a difficult question, but it's still extensive growth. Uh, we still have uh, a, few, a few minutes. There are a lot of discussions currently about, uh, let's say, uh, say the bad approach with GDP itself, uh, um, let's say, imposes or, or, or assumes, and therefore we need to measure something different uh, or add something different to measuring. And just today uh, or, or yesterday, I can't remember when I looked at what's going on on, on, on Davos, I learned a new abbreviation, DEI, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and it's additionally to uh, 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 ESG before, and uh, uh, SDG, uh, Sustainable Development Growth, uh, which was popular uh, some time ago, whatever. To what extent, in your opinion, all these additional uh, measures, not to mention why business is doing this, it's another, another discussion, uh, are important uh, um, for, uh, for this internal business and, and, and public policies uh, to drive country into the better uh, future? So uh, I personally think that these things are very important. GDP is not the only measure or not the best measure. I'm not sure what the best measure would be, but we know that GDP measure has flaws. I will be the first one to admit this. However, the talk that I'm giving you today has one very important point. And it is that the first order problem in many countries is eradicating poverty and making people move to a higher level. And for the eradication of poverty, we need GDP growth and we need economic activity. China, for example, in 1980, had 85% of the population, which is 840 million people at the time, mm -hmm living below the extreme poverty line of a dollar and 90 cents a day. 85% of the population in extreme poverty. Today, extreme poverty is eradicated. Globally, 1.6 billion people 
have been lifted out of poverty in the last 40 years. This has never happened in the history of the world before. Never, at no point in time, we have seen anything like that. So we need to address sustainability. We need to address the diversity, equity, inclusion. We need to look at all these things, but we should never forget that before everything, we need to lift people out of poverty. And then we deal also with inequality and all these things. It's a difficult problem. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, I'm telling about a relatively simple story here, but I also want to emphasize that this story is probably the most important one before we move further. Uh, well, I can, I can see some of the questions and maybe I can go very quickly if we have like oh, one, two minutes. Ian. Go back, you know, how to overcome the 25% level. I think that again, that's the anonymous ND. I would say that if the environment is created, then companies, if there is a econ strong economic incentive for companies to invest in these countries where labor costs are low. As long as your know, incomes are low, you have low labor costs. So investment will have will come uh, if the, the environment is right. Um, from poor countries will have, have huge motivation. People, so it's it's interesting. I'll, I'll look at Alexei uh, Yorimenko's question. So uh, I think that. Uh, Today, we say people in Asia have very strong motivation, and that's why they generate growth and you know, hard times. Probably it's true, but in fact, you know, here is actually I have a slide to answer this question. Here is North Korea versus South Korea at night. It's a satellite picture of North Korea and South Korea. You can see Mr. Kim's house in North Korea, and everything else is dark. And you can see South Korea, same culture, presumably same motivation, same geography. In fact, North Korea has better geography, different institutions. So when I started teaching in 96, people were saying China will never grow because China has the culture that will never lead to growth. So today we, we change our narrative. I would still say that it might be a reason, indeed, people are very motivated in Asia, but I think that people in Europe can also be very motivated. <laughs> uh, the brain drain, I think that it's, uh, I think that this question is very, uh, very important, of course. Uh, I really hope that the war will end soon, and I think that a lot of people will be coming back, and I think that from my point of view, as a dean of INSEA, there is so much will of everybody to see Ukraine recover and grow very rapidly. So I think there'll be extra efforts from other people, not only Ukrainians coming back, but also uh, everybody else. So I think that I tried to answer most of the questions, uh, special economic zones. I think special economic zones are useful, but I think that, uh, you know they 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 can be so so when you go into the detailed policy making you can do a lot of different policies like incentivizing investment in this area or that area through trade through tax concessions economic zones and i think they, there is certainly a place for all this um it uh, so the the other question from alexei is um the uh, indeed uh, the democracy question again, how can we improve institutions if we have these uh, elections and control of government? But, you know, it just hopefully your government as they're fighting now this war, once the war is over, will be willing to really think about the long-term success of the country. And then it's, they will change the institutions. It is true that it's difficult otherwise. I think I'll stop here because I feel like uh, I've abused the time. Thank you very much, Professor Miham, uh, for insightful uh, presentation and, and discussion. Uh, and uh, I, many thanks also to our attendees who were active and uh, uh, for attentive and, and for questions. 
I trust that uh, very many others will be able to see the record, the video of this of this lecture, and will enjoy uh, the uh, the depth of of analysis and and simplicity simultaneously, uh, which uh, which is striking and and very fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to draw your attention, everybody, that uh, our project is going on. Uh, and then, but the next event, the next lecture will happen in two weeks on the 1st of February at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, exactly. And our guest will be Soren Kaplan and will be speaking again about innovation, uh, one of the key elements, uh, one of the four E's, which uh, uh, today Professor Michals mentioned. On behalf of uh, all the Ukrainian audience and MIM Kiev Business School, I appreciate Professor Mikhov and I appreciate everybody who joined us today and looking forward to uh, meeting you again. And you, uh, uh, Professor Mikhov, is a special, uh, let's say, invitation to visit Ukraine again, uh, not as a schoolboy, like uh, a famous economical professor and advisors, uh, how to start building the proper institutions and moving Ukraine to leapfrog this uh, wall. Uh, of uh, and Bria. And uh, we have uh, um, a lot of willingness to, to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Slavo so Ukraini, goodbye. The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why MIM Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com.